Hello everyone, welcome back to Deep Dive. This is episode number eight, and today I'd like to talk about accents. Every composer, at some point in the composition, is going to write an accent in order to emphasize or highlight um, certain notes. We will get into all different examples of different accents, and I think it's important to do that because it's really a clue from the composer as to what they're trying to say um, through their accents in that passage by letting us know which notes are important and by really focusing on them, we can really create a story around it and decide our narrative in order to tell a story with the music. So let's explore. Some composers like Beethoven use sforzandos or isolated accents in their main melodies in order to give them new personality. For example, in the third movement of Beethoven's second piano concerto, we have this. What is interesting here is that the accent is on the second note. So going back to our two note phrases, instead of one, two, one, two, it's one, two, one, two, which makes this melody sound very different. For a minute, let's pretend like the accent sforzandos aren't there. I would play it probably like this. I think if you give any performer a score with no accents, uh, the downbeat is of great importance and you would never really jab the note adjacent to the downbeat. But because there is that sforzando, you have to go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. Because the two is important, there is millisecond gap in order for you to really jab that note forward, So, which really changes the, um, the structure of the melody. Now let's look at Beethoven's third piano concerto. It starts like this. <laughs> dramatic start to the third movement and in measure three we have these accents so instead of pum 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 we have pum 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 which is uh, what an idea I imagine people would be um, very shocked to hear that when it was first premiered so if it wasn't there you would play it so crazy about it it's dominant tonic dominant but because these accents are there it gains a whole new kind of character composers like Prokofiev also loves to put accents on off beats but these accents sound a little bit different in Prokofiev's repertoire than in Beethoven Concerti. are absolutely everywhere it's on almost all the notes the part I want to discuss with you is the part where I get to be on the beat then off the beat syncopated then back on the beat off the beat so I play ta 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 and then orchestra does exactly the same but in reverse order so ta 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 Ta, 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 ta. So what ends up happening is um, someone's always playing an offbeat um, to the downbeat that the other part is playing. And since every single note is accented, you kind of have to hold your ground. This is kind of like pianist battling with the orchestra. So instead of playing um, a very lovely two note phrase, down, up, you know, or dun, dun, going somewhere and then trying to phrase it, 
this is an exception to the two note phrase where um, you need to play two of them very equally in um, a non-warm tone. I, I try to sound like um, steel blocks here or giant magnets that fall on a surface um, in the most harsh way. Um, the only thing I think in this kind of passage that you need to think about is to um, voice it a tiny bit so it sounds like um, a chord and not just a big noise. <laughs> play a very big role in shaping Gershwin's concerto in F. And these accents on an offbeat, syncopated accents, really give it that jazzy edge. <laughs> It's very special because um, of this minor second. It gives it that extra something. In these melodies, um, to make it um, that jazzy feel, I like to play them a little bit millisecond early. So instead of making it perfectly, da 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 I play da 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 just a little bit earlier in order for me to be able to lean on that, um, that accent a little bit stronger. And when you're playing these, make sure your accent is um, proportionate to the dynamic that's given. This um, melody is in piano, so just because there's an accent, you don't really want to whack um, that clash there. It's just a little bit of that, um, uh, squeezing of your uh, fingertips, sort of like squeezing it with a little little tweezer. You don't want this um, big crashing um, bit sticking out like all by itself. It needs to belong to the rest of the phrase. So always make sure that um, it's it's appropriate um, for the repertoire and you don't do any of the, the big Prokofiev um, crashing accents here. However, in the next section, there it's it's a very different character. So uh, there there are accents actually on every single note here, uh, but the act these accents play a very different role from. These are sort of little jabs where these are something much more closer to the Prokofiev Piano Concerto accents that we explored. So how are they different? When they're um, a little bit nice, remember to go into the keys so it, it, it creates that cushion in the sound. Not, this is a little mean if you just go directly down go in, whereas these ones make sure they're the same weight and um, and th these kind of rhythmic sections, it really helps to know the what the heartbeat is. And the heartbeat is in the left hand. So, so it, it doesn't, it seem important, um, but the syncopated rhythm has to be in relation to the downbeats. So you have to really hear the relationship between them in order to know that this is a jazzy section. Because if you only hear um, the rule breaker, which is the right hand, um, then you don't know its personality at all. It needs to be in relation to the rule, which is the left hand. So make sure you play each one know the relationship between the two hands. I think that's important when any pianist plays syncopated sections because most likely one hand will play the beats and the other hand would be playing off it. Sometimes composers put accents on each measure, beginnings of each measure, if there are time signature changes in between them. 
So for example, the third movement of Gershwin's Concerto in F, we're in a double meter. So one, two, one, two. <laughs> me saying one two three in the middle of it but there is a duple meter that gets um, interrupted by a, a quick three one two three one two three one two three one two three and then to go back to yam so it's it's that change between um, the duple meter and the tri fast triple meter that um, makes this opening melody really fun and to signify that change he puts the accent in the beginnings of each measures. Sometimes the accent appears mid-phrase. So it's in a long arc and in Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto in the beginning interesting to discover when the accents appear for the first time in this progression. So in the very beginning, there's a little line over the chord, a tenuto sign, just sustain. Of course, it's pianissimo, so you're simply just appearing like you're um, from the dark, from depression. And, and then you grow and to gain strength and then you go into the fortissimo through these chords. But it's interesting to see um, until one, two, three, four, five, six, six chords still just have the tenuto sign. And then suddenly with this one, Rachmaninoff writes an accent. So what does that mean? I mean, I really try to um, keep that tension. I don't try to um, let go until that point. And when it started to be extremely emphasized by the accent, that's when you know I'm really just appearing and I'm no longer in the dark. So I make that mental transition um, in my mind when I see that um, first accent in the score because that's really when I should um, bloom and um, which means I shouldn't really uh, let go of that tension till quite late in this progression only to crash to this gorgeous C minor um, melody that the orchestra gets to play after that for the first time. Sometimes you will see that there are series of accents that create a line when you really add all of the accented notes up. So for example, in Schumann's Piano Quintet, we have this. So instead of thinking about each accented chord, it's here and here. is a chord progression that grows with each one. So just because you see a sforzando or an accent with the first chord, don't get excited and play that so loud because sometimes when you look at a long, longer line above it, then you need to get louder and louder and louder in order to keep that tension going. And so you might have to save a little bit of dynamics for the fourth, the ultimate sforzando that the composer writes. There's one more uh, kind of accent I'd like to go over with you. This is called forte piano. Forte chord 
immediately followed by a softer dynamic. And it's written on one chord, so the pianist really has no control. Um, after you play the chord, the sound will just go on and decay in whatever um, rate that the piano wants to do, and the pianist, there's nothing we can do to make it dissipate any quicker. But um, Andra Schiff uh, came up with a way to make this forte piano work on this instrument. How you do it is you play a big chord. This is beginning of Opus 13, Pathetic Sonata by Beethoven. After you play the chord, the sustained pedal goes down. Your right pedal goes down with the chord. Then you let go of the chord and then you depress the same keys again silently. Don't make any more sound. And then let go of the pedal once your hands are back down. And then listen to the sound. It'll be much softer than the one that was ringing just a second ago. So this needs to be executed very quickly because what we're trying to do is we are um, cutting that ringing time down by depressing the key silently and getting rid of that ring. So there should be a little bit of break in um, dynamics. So one chord could have two separate dynamics sort of nestled next to each other. I found this to be such a revolutionary concept. So let's, let's see if I can do it. Again here. So there you have it. I don't know if you could hear it um, or not, but I think there was a little bit of gap in between um, the dynamics within one chord. I hope you found today's episode interesting and next time you see that accent mark in your score, uh, I hope you go and explore what that could be. What message is the composer trying to tell me with that accent? Is it simple emphasis or is there a second meaning behind it? So it, I hope it brings you closer to the pieces you're working on. Thanks for watching. See you next time.